can move back to our what happens to be in the range of our 180th uh, Think Tech Hawaii Human Humane Architecture Show. This show is looking at how uh, climates, uh, so the uh, natural environment, informs um, cultures, so the built environment as its manifestation. And we're doing this in a continued uh, post-contact scenario here in Hawaii, looking at other places in the world to learn from. So today we're gonna look uh, across the pond to uh, Germany, where, which is my native country. And we have a guest with us who is very knowledgeable about that culture as well as his native culture, the United States of America. And that's uh, educator and uh, practicator, Larry Medlin. Hi, hi, Larry. Hi, Martin, how are you today? Nice to be on your program. I'm good, thanks for uh, being with us, Larry. And let's bring up the first slide and uh, look, um, uh, share with the audience a little bit how we got to know each other. So me coming from that temperate German climate and um, er in the early 90s, uh, I had a chance to be a college student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And one and a half decades later, I was kindly asked to come back as a teacher. And after another half decade, I thought uh, I might need to leave home away from home, as nice as it was, uh, to move on and to grow up. And so this is, uh, gives you an idea of the scenario about now almost another decade ago. And same weather conditions, climate conditions we're currently having here in Germany with a cold front. Up there, you see the Celsius temperatures and down at the Fahrenheit. And uh, either way, it's freezing cold. And I was living in the Century House apartment where I had two options to live on the uh, south side, which I would have had to have the curtains pulled close and AC on in the summertime, or on the north facade where I was fine in the in the summertime, but in the wintertime, as you can see at the bottom right, I had this sort of thermally not disconnected and unbroken uh, window frames that let them over eyes from the inside. So at the same time of the year, it must have been in March, about a decade ago, on a Saturday morning, I will never forget, my phone rang. And you were on the phone, Larry, and why were you calling me? I was calling to invite you to come visit us at the University of Arizona as a candidate to join our faculty. You had sent us a very impressive resume and supporting letters and so forth. And we were hoping to have an opportunity for you to come to meet us, meet us in Tucson and get to know about the university and us to get to know a little bit about you. Thank you for that. Can't thank you enough. And let's get us to the next slide and uh, take that as a chance to have you explain, as you being an, an expert in many things as climate, explain to us the very different climate in your hot, arid um, desert of Arizona, Larry. Well, the, the main difference is that most areas of the country have diffuse sky. So you have indirect radiation and then limited amounts of direct sunshine. And so for that, your temperature swings are maybe five to 10 degrees at the most, in most places throughout the year. And you have softer light. In the desert, there's very limited cloud cover. So what happens is you have a, a very large, what's called the diurnal temperature swing, the swing between the highs and the lows is about 30 degrees plus or minus in Fahrenheit uh, every day of the year. So what that means is that in the summer, it can get up to maybe 105 or so, and in a few exceptions, even more than that. But then by the evening, and, in, and actually the coolest is at the following sunrise after the nighttime, it'll get back down into the 70s. And then the same thing happens in the winter, it's just reverse. It gets up into the maybe the 70s or 75, like it will be here today, and it'll get down to about 40 as it did here last 43, I think, to be specific, as it did last night. So what that means is, is there's energies that you can deal with uh, throughout the year. And in the summer, you want to uh, shade yourself and protect yourself from the hot, summer sunshine, but you can bring in the cooling night air breezes and, and the lower temperatures. 
And that's where high thermal mass has been used to aid you in that purpose at, at both times of the year. In the winter, the sun shines directly in, hits the thermal mass, gets absorbed, and tides you over for the later part of the day. And all of that is sort of contingent on having a, a good insulation envelope around the exterior of that in most cases. So that that's that's the basic just uh, it's a very exciting uh, for a designer to think about these opportunities and how the climate responses can relate to your lifetime and activities. Absolutely. And the images uh, illustrating what you just said is my Lincoln from Lincoln that I brought with me. And that one, your son Anton, thankfully, nicely took care of because that one was just like the space shuttle that is losing its heat shields by entering the atmosphere again, that car was basically losing uh, parts of his front lights and the, the window gasket was just basically dilapidating away. And that just illustrates how hot it can get. And the picture at the very top uh, is almost uh, exactly the 105, it says 102. And I took this picture when you picked me up from the airport and drove me around. And so the situation we see on the left is what a uh, couple of days when you send me a picture uh, from your house, there was the rare situation of some snow on the mountains, which we currently also have, as I hear, back in, in Hawaii, only on the highest summits of Mauna Kea um, and, uh, and on Maui on the mountains. And we have it a lot. We, we drove up to Mount Lemon, but that's another story. Maybe we save this for later. We, we had a very significant snowfall. We had uh, up up in the village of Mount Lemon, there was almost two feet of snow. And there's actually, yeah. there's ironically, we're the southernmost the ski slope in the United States. The ski slope was open for a, a, a week or two because of the snowfall up there. And you can look out from the valley below and, you know, it got down to the foothills level, but not right down into the lowest level of the of the city itself, oh, that, but that, it, was a maybe, it was a beautiful view to look at uh, on that day. I know. Well, maybe then say it now because it's interesting because I we're still in COVID days and you luckily and thankfully got your first shot already, Larry. We're happy to hear that. And um, so uh, hopefully you guys have cases under control. So you might be able to do what we are not because we're, the origination of Oktoberfest is, of course, here in Munich. and. That one basically got shut down. And so uh, the closest in authenticity to Oktoberfest I ever experienced was actually up on Mount Levin, where we went. You have a little Oktoberfest That's right. there. That's right. That's right. Up, up on Mount Levin. It was great. And you make it as authentic as you can be. You got the ski lift there. You got the ski slopes. You got the dirndl waitresses. You got it all. Right. You got the right. gear. <laughs> all right. Before we get to taken away by that, let's go to the next slide, which is basically what you already talked about. This is showing you in the uh, Desert Museum in the Outdoor Museum, demonstrating to me what's essential in the desert and you wearing a hat and carrying a water bottle. And you taught me, you said, if you come here, you have to have both, especially since I lost my natural grown shading on my head, different than you, I got to wear a hat and I got to have a water bottle. And, you know, you, you showed me this interesting what's up there. Talk about the rattlesnake and the thermometer in relation to that, Larry. Well, the rattlesnakes, they, they sense that heat. They, they always go back in. If you're about one meter below the surface level, the temperature is constant. So they always burrow into the land and find a place. I think you may have a picture of a snake on a shelf somewhere where they go and stay in the daytime and then they crawl back out at night when it's more comfortable. Absolutely, yes. So then uh, let's go into your uh, hideaway place uh, that protects you from the elements, which is your home. So gets, let's go to the next slide. And amongst the many treasures in your house uh, that hopefully if we can get Zoom to work and in the next couple of volumes that we're gonna be together, have you also uh, be on camera, you can, show a couple of your beautiful treasures. But so far, let's look at this uh, magic memory wall here that you have. And in particular, let's zoom into one particular image there and let's bring up the next slide that shows it. And who are all these people we're looking at? Well, that was, uh, 
the, in the Institute for Lightweight Structures at the University of Stuttgart, and they had a grant to explore lightweight, wide-span buildings. It was a federal research grant that was given to uh, the University of Stuttgart, and instead of sprinkling money throughout the country, what the Germany does, they identify a special research topic, number fear and sex, number 64, was lightweight, wide-span structures. And those run for five years, and then they bring in international scholars and people working in the field, and it's an interdisciplinary process there at the university itself, and so all the participants are also there, and they come together and have, it's a one-week meeting, and everybody makes a presentation about their work, and you talk, and all these are documented, and I'm sorry we don't have the video today because I could hold up in front of you and show you some of the, the books that document these things. And that's the purpose. But the incredible thing about that is that you meet these people that you otherwise might not have the chance to meet. Uh, if you look at, at, at the picture on the first row, uh, the person sort of sitting on the steps and looking straight ahead, that's Fry Otto. Uh, the, that's Sami Angari from Saudi Arabia, who later uh, was a collaborator on some of the projects that Fry Otto did there. And then right next to him is my dear friend and who became a lifetime mentor to me. That's Conrad Voxman. He was uh, an architect uh, that was original member of the Bauhaus. He was good friends with Walter Gropius and he was a very good friend with Albert Einstein. And actually when Albert Einstein won the prize for his work with the atom and energy, he was awarded uh, uh, a house to be built for him in his honor in Potsdam, and Fry Otto became the architect of that. And so from that, they became very good friends. And then I'm sitting right next to a uh, Voxman there, and then next to him is another uh, uh, German who lives in Ireland, I think now. He moves around, so I'm not sure where he is now, called Wolf Hilberts. And he's worked with seawater accretion structures, which is a very interesting field. And if you go right behind his head, if you look straight up, you'll see a gentleman in a light colored shirt with a, looks like a black tie or scarf, a scarf going around his neck. That's Herman Kendall. He was the principal of, a Fry, of Rolf Goodboat's office, as I was the principal in Fry Otto's office when we worked on the German pavilion. And Excuse that, me. let's go to the next slide, Larry, and that's going to show once okay. again, we cropped out Fry to the very left and you on to the very right. And then we see in the middle what connected you, right? What you guys were working on and where you were working on that, right? Can you explain that a little more to us? Yeah, that's actually, if you look up, that's actually in, that's the inside of the Institute for Lightweight Structures, which is now a historic landmark in Germany. And the main structural element, which was the theme of all of these, was how to use tensile elements instead of big, massive things like columns and, you know, tapered columns and beams and so forth to support tensile structures. We found that by working with soap films, you could do it with tensile members, which allowed the structures to become even, even more important. So what we're looking up is we're looking up and we're seeing the roof uh, in what was the test structure for the German pavilion at Expo 67 in Montreal. Uh, it was uh, on the adjacent area of, of the off-campus site of the University of Stuttgart, but it was where in a piece of land where there was a future roadway to come through. So it was, well, it was found that, that there was be a possibility to develop to a permanent building. It was picked up, it was about 8,000 square feet and moved to a site about a, a half a mile away, which is now where it is re-erected. And in that site, uh, going up there, one of the, the, the things that supports is there's this, uh, uh, two ridge cables, two parallel cables that go. And in this case, one of them opens up with what we refer to as an eye loop. So that allows sunlight to come in in a diffuse way, and it gives you sort of a greenhouse space, which is, uh, you know, very useful. And that's that's the spot where everybody would gather 
twice a day for coffee or tea in the mornings and the afternoons. And then the stair beyond that is, is the uh, library out there up in the upper part of the deck. And then there was an enclosed space for dark room and other things. So, so that, that picture is if like, if, if we, instead of just looking straight across where we were to speakers on the same level that we were, if we looked up, that's essentially the view that we would see. And that's where you see, uh, because the fabric can span great distances in the time of Montreal, about 200 feet, we used a cable network with a fabric roof suspended below it. But when it wanted to be a permanent building, we developed that wood decking system with insulation and a shingle system on the exterior that we could, it was a shingle that was square with one rounded corner. So it worked like a fish scale so we could adapt it to the curves of the overall form. Yeah, and we will see that a little later, but take that little time to explain why that sort of tongue and groove uh, wooden, uh, you know, layer over the cables was different than uh, in the in the future in the other projects following there. Well, it it was because you could you could span fabric and then and then also like in the Munich Olympic complex it used a panel system of plexiglass panels with a flexible joint in between them. It used about, I don't remember the exact size, probably about four by four meter panels, bigger, bigger panels. But that was, if, if, if you look at, there's a network of cables, and, and I know it's very difficult to see in that photograph, but if you imagine there's a top layer and a bottom layer, and laying in between, on the bottom layer in between the two top layers, exactly in the middle point, is a one by three uh, structural member that if you pick it up in the middle and it's 20 feet long, it'll grape uh, 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 two feet on each end. So it's flexible. So you just lay it on and let it make the curve that way. And then by rather than pushing the tongue and groove in, you slightly turn the tongue and groove so that it follows the curvatures of, of, of the form in the other direction. So you're able to make that wood look very elegant up there. So it's, it's like a wood deck that, that actually is using its nature to adapt to the forms of the steel cable network. Impressive. And let's, you've been using the term uh, soap film and let's go to the next slide that we picked from the web, uh, representative for uh, made by yourself models and explain to the audience a little bit what, what that is. and these models that you made, Larry? Well, the, the, the one model that you're looking at is a model actually of basically the form of the Institute for Lightweight Structures uh, with, with a soap film. And the thing about soap film, soap film, if you take a flat piece of a soap film and you put a thread, a double thread in there, and then you burst the area between a double thread, the equal tension, if it's a flat film, will pull that to a curve, to a, a completely perfect circle, because it's pulling it with equal tension in every direction. But if you take one point on that curve and start to lift it up, you begin to lift up the form and go upward, so you get the anti-clastic curvature or the double curvature of the film, which in a structural purpose will allow you to pull it together with counteracting tensions to support compressive and and suction and all kinds of loads to make it stable. And, and so that was, and if you take a, if you, if you keep pulling a, a circle up, eventually you'll pull it out. But if you add, as you see in that photograph, a ridge coming down below it or behind it is a continuous ridge, you can lift it even higher and create a, a larger volume. And the, that that opening in the sofa was what we just saw in the actual real structure, looking at it from the underneath side inside. And share with us that moment where you had to make a, a, a smaller model in a very short amount of time, very quick and fast. Share that situation, Larry. Well, the the, the German pavilion was the first. The, the Barcelona pavilion was a major work that Germany did. A, you know, uh, before the World Wars, uh, and 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 it was very famous, and so everybody was very nervous that Germany didn't want to build something new on the stage unless it was really was an outstanding building, 
and it has to live up to the same standards as the Barcelona Pavilion. So it wasn't just an ordinary project. There was an invited competition. Six architects were invited by the German, the, at that time, the West German government to sum, do submissions. Uh, we, the Fry Auto and Rolf Goodbuild as a team, I mentioned Herman Kendall and myself collaborating as leaders of those teams, uh, worked together and we won, won that competition. But when we won the competition, they said, well, we're not just going to design something and carry it over to Montreal and build it and have it not work. You've got to build a test building to show that it works. So uh, the, Mr. Uh, Galandi had come down from the Bonn at that time, which was the seat of the government, to, to Stuttgart for a big important meeting to, to decide after we had won the competition if we were really going to take this seriously and go further. And that meeting was scheduled, I guess, at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and we were there in the office Actually, you were working on further development of ideas for the design and the pavilion itself. But Fry Otto came up to me and said, Larry, I think they're going to want us to build a test structure for this. And can you, And we talked about it. Well, let's build a piece like what you actually saw in that cell film, a piece that demonstrated a, a eye loop with a ridge and a one that did a little ridge and all the edge conditions. And, and try to make it become elegant proportions and form and shape so that it would be a reasonable building so that we might find a uses for it later. So I don't know how I did it, you know, when I look back, but I was younger and had more nimble fingers and stuff. But I got a model built in about two and a half hours, and, and about 15 minutes later, Fry Auto showed up with it and looked, looked at that model. And the irony of that, that 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 shape and that form was tweaked and moved with all kinds of computer problems and stress analysis, but it it didn't move by more than three or four inches in either direction. That was pretty. It was one of those lucky sort of things. You just try to use your best thing and you know get it together and do what you can do, and it worked out very fortunately for us on that occasion. Priceless, Larry. And let's go to the next slide and look at the next stage model, which I think we can call the steel model because it has a steel frame below. And that's going to look into the next sort of elaborate stage of prototyping, which is very much is, right? The, yeah, the, the, the next stage is, is the, uh, that's actually the, the, the steel cable network that we built for the German pavilion. It was fabricated in Strohmeyer's factory in Constance. And it was uh, actually, uh, the cable network was uh, a half meter by half meter and half inch cables. And the reason for that was that you could walk through it and work them and crawl all over it and, and building it and stuff. And plus it was flexible enough so that you could make it into literally 10 meter sections that were like a, a giant piece of carpet that were 10 meter by however length they were with an arcing edge on both edges and, and, and then splice joints to connect to the next panel. And those were rolled up and shipped over to the side in Montreal and then laid out on the ground and then all connected together. And then it was like putting the, the, the strip patterns of a sail together on the ground and then raising it up the mass later to erect the structure. I know. And this is something interesting for us in Hawaii where we try to, and we were talk, you were talking about building less basically ethereal, heavy, elephant-like and more um, ethereal, more like a bird. And um, so um, in, in Hawaii where we ship in lots of things, if you're shipping in things, you want to ship in as little as possible. So shipping in cables. Well, and, and, all, and it also allows you to take it to remote sites and remote conditions. Yeah, and Hawaii is pretty remote, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I actually, and not one of these projects, but another project with working with medical doctors at the University of Arizona uh, Public Health College, we built uh, a, a portable pavilion for nighttime blindness. And it was a double layered fabric tent that was about, uh, let's say, uh, 20 feet by 15 feet where people could be tested for nighttime blindness. But 
to do that testing, which was for vitamin A deficiency, it was made in parts that you could literally, in most cases, you put it in the back of a pickup truck and took it into the local villages where they're going to do the testing. But if you had to, you could take it, including the big structural arch supports, which broke down into pieces. You could make it into backpacks so serpents could carry it up to the most remote sites in the world. And it was used in Nepal, so it did get to some of those kind of sites. Well, that's great. So to do the most with the least, which was, you know, Fry's agenda. Well, the, you know, another point, Martin, about that is that it, and this in particular, as you advance through your project to looking at space net structures, is how it meets the ground. Most buildings, you know, build huge foundations and they destroy the local ecological system and so forth. And you have to often distort completely the contours and the runoffs and the impact upon that. But with lightweight structures, you literally can sort of almost hover them above the ground. So you can yeah. discreetly decide where you're going to put your points of contact with the ground and let natural things move through and around it. So... That, yeah. that creates some really interesting problem possibilities in applying these in space nets in the future projects. Absolutely. And speaking of barely scratching the surface, that's what we did in our almost 28 minutes. And so uh, let's get to the end of the show and bring up the next and the last picture, which is an exterior photograph of that test building you were talking about. And by that point, maybe phasing out and uh, maybe we go, we switch to German because people might wonder, you know, how you've been communicating and you're pretty fluent in my native language. So maybe from now on, you say uh, in that one, just to refresh it, you're doing good in that. Don't, don't worry about it. Oh, we can, we say tschüss then, you know, when we phase out, which we no, have. No, uh, uh, it's have very gelegenheit in, in, in Tucson. Also, when I go to the Wooster Museum and, and Deutsche Besuchers and da, uh, Deutsche Hören, aber it's it, it, much more, uh, it's a winner to nuke, but uh, it, it dowered on, on this site, but you know, it, it, it comes, doch. This is a good Gelegenheit. This is a good opportunity to refresh your German, which is it's still pretty good, believe me, trust me. And again, uh, we're at, at the end of our first 28 minutes and we're looking forward to many more shows, which is gonna be uh, many more volumes and uh, continue to tell that exciting story of uh, your life and work, Larry, uh, both uh, professionally and academically with uh, the great Fry Otto, with Bucky Fuller, in addition, who you got to know, uh, your friend Conor Rexman and many more. You work at the University of Washington and the University of Arizona. So I can't wait for next week to reconnect. And until then, we say tschüss and auf Wiedersehen and uh, stay all happy and healthy there and uh, stay warm in the evenings, Larry. <laughs> yes, th thank you very much. And I wish the students all the luck in their project. It's a very exciting project and I'll look up forward to a opportunity for a couple more interactions with him so absolutely take, you're, take all you're good. a mentor and master so uh, vielen dank <laughs>